Hello, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Retained Recruiter Show. My name is James. My name is Joe. Thank you all very much for joining us today. Very exciting show, haven't we got today, James? Oh, very exciting. They're all exciting. But uh, today we welcome Neil Carberry. Neil Carberry uh, is the Chief Executive Officer of the REC. For those of you outside of the UK, the REC stands for the Recruitment and Employment Confederation. Uh, Neil's got a long uh, career in the in the industry of recruitment, but also has worked in such august bodies as the CBI, where he was the MD, and uh, lots of other things that maybe we'll tell you about. Look him up on LinkedIn if you're not already connected with him. So, Neil, welcome to the Retained Recruiter Show. We're delighted to have you, as Joe said, and thank you for joining us today. Well, absolutely delighted to be here, Joe and James. Looking forward to digging into it. There's, you know, there's a little bit going on. Yeah, I think, yes. I think that certainly is true. Um, and if you're listening today, what, a couple of things I want to share with you. If you do have any questions, please do pop them in the box. We'll endeavour to answer those as we go uh, through the system. It is a live show, so if you're watching this on playback, then obviously we won't be answering those, but please get your questions to us and we'll do our best to return. Now, we invited everybody to the show today and we gave you the topic about how the recruitment industry is shifting versus the shifts that you must make right now. And it's really interesting because... We're in preparation for these uh, events. They don't just happen. We do put in preparation behind the scenes on these. Yeah, we've been preparing this for some time and there have been some shifts even in that time. Is that is that not the case, Neil? Yeah, look, it's um, it's been a fascinating uh, year so far. I mean, the most obvious thing about recruitment is it's traditionally it's a hyper cyclical industry. Mm -hmm. So if there's a, a bit of a recession, we take it worse than most. But we all know that when the economy comes back, recruitment comes back first. And, and that cycle of, you know, uh, temp goes off a bit, perm goes off a bit, temp comes back, perm comes back is pretty standard across recessions. Um, Obviously, inflation is very, very high at the moment. Energy costs are high. Uh, there's been, since the beginning of the year, a real sense that the first half of the year for recruiters, it was going to be supercharged. And then we'd have either a soft landing or a hard landing about now. Yeah. Um, I think a month ago, it looked like a pretty hard landing, albeit softened by the fact that the labour market in the UK specifically, and we had numbers this morning that proved this again, mm. is so tight that actually the talent shortage doesn't go away if client demand drops a bit, you know, case in point, I think supermarket Christmas demand in the supply chain is probably 90% of what it was last year. Um, but we weren't filling at 90% last year. Yeah. So there, there's actually no loss to the industry in terms of, in terms of business levels. Um, what's happened in the last month, a couple of things. I think we've seen some really concerted action by governments. Uh, the UK government, the announcement uh, last Thursday morning before the uh, sad events of last Thursday afternoon from the British government, uh, but also pretty clear signalling from the German government and very obvious action in the US has kind of sent a signal to markets that the states are willing to act. You've started to see the gas price come off. Obviously, that's been enhanced over the last couple of days by events in Ukraine, which have mm. unbalanced, weakened yeah. um, the, posi the, uh, uh, the position of the Russian government, although that's very unpredictable. And then ultimately, China will come out of its zero COVID policy over time and we will start to see a supply chain issues ease. So all of that says um, I'm a bit more optimistic this time this month than I was this time last month about the economy, albeit that I think away from the cycle, we're in a period of massive change generally, where recruiters need to be thinking really hard about, okay, maybe demand goes down a bit over the next six months, then it goes back up. How do we position for it going back up? And also, how do we know what the problems our clients will have then are rather than the ones that they used to have? Mm -hmm. Because I think the pain points have shifted. Mm, that's a really interesting point, actually. And um, I know we want to talk, we want to pick your brain about that and your insights and what you think the market's going to look like and how you think businesses can best uh, sort of proof themselves against that or, or ready themselves for it. Um, you mentioned earlier on about the fact that it, it might not be such a hard landing as we thought it was going to be. So to come on to the, the big R, I suppose, this potential recession, what are your thoughts around that now and how that might or might not affect us as an industry? So I would... I would encourage people to think about uh, a, a recession as pretty much inevitable. Um, you know, the Bank of England's governor does not talk about a recession unless there's definitely going to be one. Uh, 
The question is, what sort of recession are we going to have? You know, a recession is just people doing a little less this month and the, the, this quarter than they did last month and last quarter. It's a big difference between a gentle kind of pretty anemic period mm -hmm. and, you know, and something that looks more like 2008 or March 2020, you know, where things go off a cliff. Yeah. I'd encourage people to think that there might be quite a, a that, that the breaks might go on progressively over the next few months, but to expect a longer period of slightly anemic growth rather than a big drop off. Yeah. And for owners and managers of recruitment firms, that probably means that growth is getting a bigger slice of the pie for the next couple of years rather than just as yeah you know, just riding the market up i think yeah. for owner we did something with greg savage in london the other week and i i think there's a really good point here which is in two in 2020 we were all in the same storm as the market went down yeah. late 20 into 21 we we're all in the same storm as the market recovered so you know most recruiters had a good year last year or having a good year this year i think that will decouple now so it's what you do in your business now to prepare for what's next where you choose to invest um how you understand where you create value in your business and what you ask your people to do versus your technology all of that will be differentiated because i think that the nature of the slowdown and then the recovery that we're going to have is going to be much more um uh navigable for those owners and managers who make the right decisions now mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, that's great. Oh, there we go. We've got a, a first uh, question. Come I to, yeah, I spoke to a high energy young man today who was immensely successful post of work the day. Ah. Yeah, there you go. Shall I tell um, you a little, a little good news story? Yes. The REC has been working with uh, one of the restart providers. Um, we had a jobs fair in Leeds last week. Um, we've got a couple of members of staff at the REC who are working on this, just linking uh, people up to, uh, to opportunities. We had 100 young people uh, start uh, jobs. Uh, so we had a hundred. I shouldn't. I shouldn't say a hundred young people because technically we haven't yet because it doesn't get uh, signed off to the end of the month. So I'll do the end of August figures. We've taken a hundred vacancies through that yeah. system and filled sixty-eight of them with young people in different different ways. Now you ask any recruiter whether a sixty-eight percent fill rate on the vacancies you're taking is good or bad. It's not bad. Yeah. Um, so that kind of stuff. Uh, absolutely um, about apprenticeships, but also people coming off welfare to work. It goes to the heart of things, which is today we had the lowest unemployment rate we've had since uh, 1974. Yeah, absolutely. But simultaneously, employment and hours worked are lower than they were in February 2020. Yeah. Because people, we've got more people in inactivity. So we need to sort those NHS uh, backlogs out um you know lots of you know we've got 500 members at the rec who are working in healthcare so work out how we resource to do that mm -hmm. uh to get people who are sick back into the labor market young people who've been in college like to feed in but there's also lots of people who've stepped back from the the old job and want mm -hmm. to work in different ways and so to darren's point here about what can recruiters do in light of a talent set uh, shortage to help companies recruit talent uh with potential through apprenticeship schemes and actually generally is we've got to climb that value tree to have a discussion with companies about what will and what will not attract because companies can hire we've got one of the highest velocities of hiring that we've ever had in britain going on job to job yeah but it's pulling people who aren't currently in a job in and i think that does require that kind of professional services relationship with your clients so you talk about where's the value created in your business well one of them is in the conversations your people are able to have with clients and candidates to close exactly that gap darren's pointing to yeah. yeah, we um we talk a lot with our clients about that's so educational recruitment. So actually being able to advise your clients mm -hmm. on um, how they can get talent into their businesses, particularly when we are looking at, you know, from a very sort of fundamental point of view, a, a talent shortage. We need to start looking overseas. We need to start looking into pools that we maybe wouldn't have looked in before. Um, and I love apprenticeships. I think they're a great route in mm -hmm. for people, but also for businesses to really start to bring in, where, particularly if you've got these skill gaps in an organisation. Well, and, and think about kind of enlightened self-interest as well. If you've got that educational recruitment approach with your clients, right? One of my favorite quotes of this year was I did an interview uh, with Tim Cook of Engage uh, at our conference. And Tim said, you know, Neil, the issue is here. You never stiff your mates. 
And what he meant was, if you've got that relationship with a client where you are their advisor and you help them navigate things, then actually the fee conversation, the, the ability to have annuity or retained income goes up. Mm. And we're definitely seeing more and more recruiters saying, look, in this in the high demand environment, the first half of 2022, what we've done is we've tried to build some relationships mm. with our best clients, which if the market goes down, we'll keep investing in because we know they'll bounce. And, you know, we're not going to write business in a high demand market with people who are wanting to squeeze the margin because we know they'll come back. But it's a it's a lot of effort for a 20 percent fill rate on uh on a contingency basis and i think we've got to think about that about it that way and actually think about how we deal with client uh, candidates in the in the same way so and and that when i talk about where value is created in a recruiting yeah. business that's a big part of it is what the humans do and then obviously underneath that we need to just get super efficient at all the stuff we can let the tech do yeah, and I, and I think that's I think that's important as well. And it's it's interesting when you look at this year, and I, and I, I, get, I go back to you know, the post the the, the economic uh, the financial one back in uh, the the late noughties in terms of of what we did. And I remember at the conference there uh, talking about it, saying now is the time to cement your relationships with your clients. They're not hiring at this particular time. I know I know it's different this time, and it, it, it comes around in different in different terms in the way that you said. But those clients who have got high volumes, it's about staying in touch with clients cementing those relations building those relationships but if there is going to be some type of softening of, of the market they know that you're not just there for the good times as in taking their taking their money uh, and staying in touch with those and building those relationships and adding in the value so that you do become this trusted advisor so that you know to use that you know what you said earlier you don't stiff your mate your clients you know not this about matey but actually there's that there's that trust and respect between exactly. between that and if you if you establish enough relationships and this is the the one thing that that annuity based revenue it's you know everyone's sort of craving to, to to generate that but it's relationship driven and if you if you've got an educational standpoint that joe said and a challenging one where you actually can challenge your clients to look at things differently um you can you know build those relationships and they become long term and that's what we need to help recruiters do i believe we need to help educate recruiters who need to educate their clients the employers in terms of best practice in recruitment where they add value is to in terms of looking at the market what talent pools are available out there for them what they should do and that's that's what we try and do and i love the point you said there you know underneath that where do we add value it's at the client candidate side we'll come back to the candidate in a moment and what do you what what can you automate that's where you bring technology into it yeah. so you know, making sure that, you know, technology enables a business. Um, but, you know, if you've got technology in the business, you've still got to have the people side to to cement that uh, side into it. Yeah, and you buy technology with the knowledge of what the people side does. You know, you have kind of, you, you need skills in your business to understand the tech that you're buying. Yeah. Uh, but for for me, there's, t yeah. I mean, I spent, I, I started in recruitment and then I, uh i took a 15 year busman hall at the busman's holiday to industrial relations because yeah. what i really like is beer and sandwiches um mm -hmm. and i'm still on the council of acas uh yeah. on resolving disputes which let me tell you is a really interesting place to be sitting right now in terms of what we're what we're seeing i was um for my sins i was the man who got to phone the er director of pno for the government uh yeah. back in because yeah. back in they were just they were just refusing to talk to the government about what they were doing uh, and so they the wow. kind of the finger of uh, the finger of Neil, can you give him a call, fell on me. But uh, if we look at what's going on right now, uh, broad broadly, you know, figure, I spent 15 years at the CBI talking to clients, basically recruiters now, HRDs, FTSE 100, FTSE 250. A um, couple of insights from good colleagues. Um, Neil Morrison at Severn Trent. The one thing I don't want recruiters to do right now is tell me it's difficult. I know it's mm -hmm. difficult. I want them to tell me what I should be doing. Yeah. And Jane yeah. Haynes, who's now at Rio Tinto, always pick up the phone and just tell me something interesting. Tell me something that's relevant to the to the problem that I have right now. Don't phone me up and talk about you know the candidates you have. Don't phone me up and pro and prospect. Just say, look. We think this might be on your mind. Here's some stuff we that we're doing. Do you want to chat about it? Whether that is how do you reach into underfish talent pools, or you know what are you doing at entry level to bring people through? Going back to the apprenticeship point, mm -hmm. and I and I think having the space and time in a recruitment business to view that as the kind of marketing we need to be doing now, yeah, is is super important to just. 
investing in the value of your brand and the value of your relationships. Yeah. Think, so you, think, sorry, oh, sorry, James. <laughs> I think we're going to ask the same question. I, was, I think we'll come on to technology in a minute because I think that's a massive point uh, at the moment. But with you saying then about adding value, um, again, a, you know, a, a really interesting point. I love that um, the the um, the feedback that you get from, like you said, the, the sort of the business owners or the the um, the end users of, of recruiters that actually they don't want problems, they want solutions. Um, and that if your only value is sending them CVs, there is so much more, isn't there, that we need to do to, to propose real true value to our clients. So what would your thoughts be on that? If a recruitment business was sitting watching this and thinking, we just send CVs and we don't really phone our candidates and clients when they're not looking, how can we upscale ourselves in terms of value? So never have an unplanned conversation with a client, obviously, but make some space in your week an hour two hours three hours to think about the direct you know what what's the business i want uh you know borrow from greg savage again how do i make my business sellable mm -hmm. because we're going to want to do the things that make make our business sellable every day in everything we do so what does that business look like and what what would it be doing and then look back at the week and the month that you're having and are you doing that yeah so you know you know, what actually is your, you know, if your rate card, you know, I'm stealing directly from Greg here, but if your rate mm. card says 25% and then you always negotiate down from it, well, is your rate card really 25%? You know, so how are we, how are you getting uh, some, uh, how, how are you pricing up a professional service rather than a, a transactional service that can just be whittled away over time? Because that's what happens. And all of that is based on using some of that time to say, when did when did I last talk to, take our list of 15 biggest clients, when did I last talk to them without a long-term sales, without a, without a sales pitch? Yeah. As in, because of course it is a sales pitch, but it doesn't need to be a sales pitch for now. It's an advised sale. It's a bit like, actually, I often talk to to uh, other membership organizations about selling or corporate organizational membership um and the way you understand the membership of the rec or the um or the uh cbi is look it's absolutely not a club that we're all in because we believe in the brother and sisterhood mm -hmm. it's a bit of that but it's also it's not a tin of beans it's not you pay me this and i give you something and and therefore it's a complex sale and you need to walk people through it and you can only walk people through it if you're having kind of reasonably regular conversations where they can see and touch you what you do and see the value of it because right out there there are loads of businesses some of which uh may be well-known jobs boards who are trying to convince the, uh, uh, uh clients that they can go direct and we know they can't yeah but we need to show not just tell Mm -hmm. well, I think one of the expressions we use, Joe, a lot in, in our business, obviously, you know, we work with recruitment agencies, we help technologize their business, but we also do a lot of training to help them guide them through the process, whether they're looking to sell exclusive contingent or retained recruitment, you know, we cover both those areas, of course. And one of the things that we try and get people to think about is that that value add perspective. And, uh, and without meaning to de denigrate recruiters, we try to differentiate in terms of what you're adding value to say that, uh, and the expression we use is we like people to act as management consultants who specialize in talent acquisition, which means you can facilitate a conversation with a client that doesn't end in, have you got any jobs? Mm -hmm. um, because that that doesn't, then you're just another another person who's on the gravy train of just trying to sort of, you know, chase jobs and chase jobs and chase jobs. So I think we need to take it away from that. And, and that becomes part of that, that process where you are consultative, you do talk to people. It's not just about a transaction today or tomorrow. It's about the longer term picture. Uh, and understanding that. And just, I just want to go back to one thing that you said, you know, we were talking earlier about, um, and we'll come back to this question that's on screen, Jared. We will mm -hmm. we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. We're just digesting it because it's a long, a lot of words. Um, but one of, the, one of the interesting things we saw from one of our clients, you know, you were saying earlier on this year was a good year for recruiters. One of our clients um, who's appeared on this show, actually, he, had, he was approached by one of his clients who said, uh, Chris, you've been doing some great work for us. Um, we'd like to recruit some more people for, from you. Uh, we'd like you to recruit, I can't remember, the six or 10 people. Um, but and he said, you know what's coming out? This client's going to sort of squeeze me on, on the fees um, because it's going to be a multi-sale multi deal. I said, we normally pay you 20%. But knowing how difficult the market is, we want to pay you 25% because we want you focused on this type of work. That was a really enlightened client. I'm not saying every client 
do that. And yeah, we'd um, all like that client. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Clue <laughs> them. Uh, I'm glad it's happened to one of our clients because he's got a great process to sort of drive them through. And that, and, and what Chris has done is over the last three years, him and his business partner, they've grown their business and you know brought on recruiters, brought people into the business. That thing you're saying about planning in advance, mm -hmm. for example, thinking about how do I go next? Because he started his business. He's been in recruitment for a number of years, but started the business in 2019. Six months in, bang, what's happened? You know, so it's five man business. What's happened to it is now a 25 man business because he looked a little bit forward ahead. He planned, he prepared and did all the things. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, slightly going off track. It gets you over the valley of death, doesn't it? Which is you know, that yeah. kind of long term, that kind of long ter uh, term planning. And I think some of it is is knowing when to walk away. It's, there's mm -hmm. no point, you know, many, many people's mums and dads have said it, but, you know, the the I'll, I'll I'll give it to Park Arbery because he's driven it home in, to me uh, when we're talking about business. You know, turnover is vanity. It's vanity. Yeah. Profit is sanity and cash is reality. And uh, always run your business, uh, business on that basis. If if clients are pushing you to do things where you're making no money, don't do it on the you have have the guts to walk away because I think yeah. we have to we have to value our services and not play a game that leads to the whole sector being uh, just yeah, sadly yeah. sliced away. Mm -hmm. Fight to the bottom, really, if we're, if we're not yeah. careful. So we've got a, a good question from here, from Jarrett, saying, hello, panel, thanks for this event. Uh, recruitment tech has changed everything. But he's also looking to integrate a feedback workflow. And I find this interesting. It allows applicants mm -hmm. to compare their profile versus others in the case they're not selected. And obviously, this is introducing things like uh, behavioral assessment, psychometrics into the process to see how mm -hmm. they do that. And it's interesting the comparison because we work with an organization on the behavioral side, uh, and there are many out there. We work with one called the McQuaig Institute who do a lot of comparisons and benchmarking against, you know, from candidate to candidate, which is really valuable. And he's saying he sees this as a quality assurance measure to identify unfair practices, and he's still seeing an imbalance. Uh, what's our take on this one? So I think the, the most important thing for me on this is um, if you look at what Jarrett's proposing, is UX, you know, what, yeah, are we convinced that enough people, that it will be simple enough, that enough people will use it, that it will generate the kind of, um, the, the kind of critical mass that, that you're looking for? I think this thing about how we use big tech to, to look for, um, unfair practices is hugely relevant. I've been having a little chat recently with a group of people who are think, trying to set up um, a, pay comparison, a, a pay comparison site, starting with women, talking about what they're paid for different jobs, and maybe yeah. then moving on to uh, uh, other groups and uh, looking at ethnicity. And I think that kind of big data approach has some potential. I think one of the, the challenges for any corporate looking at delivering it, of course, is uh, liability if people don't like what they, they see. So you just need to be a bit careful with, mm. with that. But that idea that we're going to be using big data to drive better and fairer processes, I think if you're not thinking about that, perhaps not to the extent that Jarrett is, but if you're not thinking about that uh, right now, as a as a recruiter, you're going to miss a trick because yeah. increasingly, particularly on EDI, it's not enough just to say the right words. Yeah, you've got, I mean, to, you've got to demonstrate. Yeah, yeah great. Thank you. Um, so Jamie Town has uh, given us a question. What advice would you give to someone who's asking out in a brand new sector in the current climate? Mm -hmm. uh, that's interesting because you've got a view on the, I think, the maturity of the industry. Um, yeah, or some insight into the maturity of the industry. So I, I, I think the maturity, certainly in the UK, the industry is very mature now. Um, and therefore, um, that size of the pie, you know, you're competing against often established players. Um, I'd, I'd start by why would a firm in your in this sector buy its services from you as opposed to another perhaps more established player? And I think part of it comes down to relationships. Can you build the relationships that you need? So everything we've already discussed about. And some of it comes about, have you got a unique analysis either of the pain points for firms in that sector or of kind of potential solutions to staffing in that sector? And I think if you find, I think know, know your USP is kind of a lazy answer for me to give, but I think it is that piece of um, 
can you build a relationship with one or two really good P companies who are willing to give you a try because you've got something either you've got an analysis of their pain point that that sticks with them or you've got a bit of tech or a bit of approach that that speaks to them but you know narrow and building the relationships will always work better than kind of bombarding the the sector the yes. old, uh, the old narrative of being going going down a you know a, you know being a, an inch deep rather than being a mile wide and going all the way down or whatever yeah. the expression is we'll get to inch uh, well, wide mile we, deep yeah not the other yeah, way around <laughs> and uh, so it's interesting so uh, the reality is uh yeah so it's so a response there from darren but uh, again darren, one of the things you said is you know you know for example you know have some tech or some uniqueness and one of the things mm. that i see on usps is most of them are just sps um, because mm -hmm. everybody saw it sound the same. And uh, Jamie is actually a very new client of ours, and I know he's, he's watching it today, so uh, welcome, Jamie. Uh, and so obviously with regards to our intro, we do provide some tech, and if you do want to sort of find out more about that, please do get in touch with us. We'll happily sort of share with you our thoughts and views on the market, and we'll pop up on screen as a moment in a place where you can actually have a consultation with us. But uh, giving people that uh, in, you know, that ability to sort of you know differentiate themselves in the market, it's not just tech, it's still about the person, of course. Um, you know, tech is the enabler, as we spoke about earlier, but uh, no, do please do get in touch with us if we if you if you'd like some help or some advice or some some support on so absolutely i'm not sure how much time we've got but i think we need to ask this question because it has been asked off uh, camera it's, it's um you've been quoted as saying that recruitment is a tech enabled people business and i yeah. love that and i've seen recruitment businesses you know not to be disrespectful but i have seen businesses sort of drown themselves in technology because they bought it not really knowing what to do with it um so what would your advice be to a recruitment business around tech and how to get tech to work for them rather than um, sort of challenge them? Um, now, am I allowed to say on your show? Well, I'm going to say it anyway. Don't trust the vendors as far as you could throw them. Uh, <laughs> but what I mean by that is have someone who doesn't have an agency problem on your staff. Have someone who works for you and whose job it is to understand what the user's jobs are and the users of your consultants mm -hmm and therefore be able to have a much more informed discussion with the vendors and so so that when they talk to your guys or to other firms there's a sense of you can get past the yeah our system does that mm -hmm. and into well how does it do, do that and how does it integrate with that and how do we understand you know what data we'll be getting back because if you talk about you know selling points for a recruitment business you know some very big firms pay a lot of money to sourcing places like job sites for candidates that are already on their database mm. yeah so the, the, there's something there but if you can make the tech work to 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 squeeze the doubling up of spend to make sure you know there's some really clever stuff going on since the kind of frankly usurious jobs board price increases early in the year to look at buying jobs board space as uh, as though it's media marketing Mm -hmm. and you, you know like buying television adverts and 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 thinking about i know what works for this job as opposed to that job and of course that's all about using understanding what your tech will do for you having someone on your team who can who can interact with the tech providers on the level about what you need making sure it's giving you data that is not driving your decisions but helping you make decisions about how you how you advise consultants on what will what will return for them and then packaging all of that up to the clients as a really stable delivery service onto which you can layer that educational recruitment approach if you could that's that's a kind of silver bullet of kind of a package of a, a firm if you get get there with a few clients that's where your retained annuity income starts to flow yeah yeah Good. Well, we start off today with the the you know the the, the headline for the the show being how the recruitment industry is shifting. And I think what we said there is it is shifting. We, we've obviously had you know we've come through some some good times. We would have expected or you know all the indications where it could have been a, a lot worse than we think it's probably going to be. But I think the message is still a little bit of planning needs to take place so that you don't lose sight of you know, just because it may not be as hard as we thought it would may be doesn't mean you can just stick your head in the sand and forget about it. You're still going to look at you know, lift your head up and, and have a look forward. So so what are your thoughts and uh, thoughts and sort of expectations for the market as we go into 2023 and possibly a little bit further beyond? So if you look at the secular trends in the British labour market, as opposed to the cycle, um, it ought to be a pretty good time if you are a talented recruiter for the next decade. 
Uh, my favourite stat, everyone gets it, and I bored everyone to death with it, but it's the most fundamental fact about the British labour market, which is 50% more babies were born in 1964 than 1977, right? There are a lot of baby boomers, and they are starting to retire, and the young, the generations below them are smaller. That means that there is just a contraction happening in the domestic labour force. Um, and you know, net net immigration doesn't really touch the sides on this. Yeah. Um, that means that for the next next 10 years, a labour market generation, you're probably looking at quite a tight labour market. And because of technology, you're looking at a significant skills cr uh, crisis. You know, we all know that you know, IT recruitment hasn't had a recession since 2008, um, whereas we all the rest of us all had one in 2020. We can see the demand. We were talking before we came on about social care. We can see the demand of that aging population in social care and healthcare. There's a lot there to do for, you know, in the public policy space where the REC is working on behalf of the industry, there's a lot to do with government. But the clients need to think about it differently as well. I spoke to a group of Anglo-French businesses this morning and they are wrestling with all the tools that they have used for the last 20 years not working anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a fellow of the CIPD, so I'm allowed to be slightly sniffy about the HR profession. But the HRM one size fits all manual that says where you, you get the company song right yeah. and everything else flows does not work. You have groups in your labor markets who want different things. Some people are really focused right now on pay because inflation is 10%. Some people are really focused on well being. You need to understand that. You need to understand what your offer is as a client um, as a, a, and how you're bringing people in across. What am I buying? Paying a bit more permanent. What am I borrowing from through a staffing agency? And what am I growing through an apprenticeship? Mm -hmm. And all of that is really complex and most resourcing and HR chiefs are a bit lost. Mm -hmm. Don't let them waste their money on McKinsey. Yeah. <laughs> Spend, get those partnerships into place and make those people your collaborators in a discussion that is much more about what can we do practically to resource this business in the jobs we are creating, not the jobs we've always had? That's a fair, that's a huge opportunity in every sector, I think. And uh, so I'm 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 predisposed to optimism generally. Uh, okay. Some people find that unbelievable, given that I'm a Scot. But there you go. Um, I think there's something here about us as an industry having a moment to step up and to step in in a way that, frankly, we haven't had in the last thirty years because the labour market has been quite loose yeah, indeed well listen I'm, the headline i'm going to take away from that is uh you know if you're a great recruiter the next 10 years are looking good um that's what we'll we'll take that as a little snippet and take that away uh yes. joe anything to sort of wrap up with as we get to, uh, yeah. no um just thank you neil i think that was really insightful um it's great just talking i think about the industry i think this is what recruitment business owners and recruiters need to do more as well just you know widen the peripheral vision about what's going on in their industry that's why they should join the rec Yes, Absolutely. there you go. Look at that. I thought you'd go across. 80% of the market by turnover are members of the REC. So if you're in the 20%, don't miss out. That's yeah, all. Well, 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 yeah. And also, Neil, you're a member of the WEC, the World Employment Federation. Indeed, well. yes, absolutely. So I'm we do have a lot of international clients listening in, so it's great to have you there. Listen, and Neil, it's been some fascinating insight. I know, obviously, you're a very busy man. You've had a very busy day as well. So we do really appreciate your time in joining us today. We look forward to seeing you back at some point in the future just to see whether you're aspirations and thoughts and inspirations for the future have actually come true so thank you very much for joining us uh, and from everybody here at the rrs retained recruiter show we look forward to seeing you again thanks very much neil thanks very thank much you. Everyone. thank Bye -bye. you neil